Home, premiering December 14th on C-SPAN. The House Oversight and Government Reform Committee today looked at hedge funds as part of its series of hearings on the financial markets. Hedge fund managers, including George Soros, testified about their compensation and proposals to regulate hedge funds. Congressman Henry Waxman of California chairs the committee. This part of the hearing is two hours. Committee will please come back to, uh, to order. Our second panel consists of five of the most successful hedge fund managers of 2007. George Soros is the chairman of Soros Fund Management. James Simons is the president of uh, Renaissance Technologies. John Paulson is the president of uh, Paulson and Company. Philip Falcone is the senior managing partner of Harbinger Capital Partners. And Kenneth Griffin is the president and chief executive officer of Citadel Investment Group. And we're pleased to welcome all of you to our hearing today. Uh, I, I appreciate your being here and, um, and cooperating with our committee. I, I understand Mr. Falcone had a rescheduled an overseas business trip to join us today, and I particularly appreciate the fact that he's here. It's the practice of this committee that all witnesses that testify before us do so under oath, so I would like to ask each of you, before you even begin giving your testimony, to please stand and raise your right hand. Do you uh, solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before the committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? The record will indicate that each of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Your prepared statements will be in the record in full. What we'd like to ask each of you to do is to make a, a presentation to us, mindful of the fact that uh, we'll have a clock that will uh, be green for four minutes, orange for one minute, and then red at the end of five minutes. And at that point, if you see that it's red, we'd like to ask you to uh, conclude your uh, oral presentation to you, to us. Uh, we're gonna, going to want to leave uh, enough time for uh, questions by the members of the panel. Mr. Soros, uh, we'd like to start with you. There's a button on the base of the mic. Be sure it's pressed in, and please proceed as how you see fit. <coughs> There's a button, yep. Thank you. Uh, we are in the midst of the worst financial crisis since, since the 1930s. The salient feature of the crisis is that it was not caused by some external shock, like OPEC raising the price of oil. It was generated by the financial system itself. This fact, that the a defect was inherent in the system, contradicts the generally accepted theory about financial markets. The prevailing paradigm is that markets tend towards equilibrium. Deviations from the equilibrium either occur in a random fa fashion or are caused by some sudden external event to which markets have difficulty in adjusting. The current approach to market regulation has been based on this theory, but the severity and amplitude of the crisis proves convincingly that there is something fundamentally wrong with it. I have uh, developed an alternative paradigm that differs from the current one in two important respects. First, financial markets don't reflect the underlying conditions accurately. They provide a picture that is always biased or distorted in some way or another. Second, the distorted views held by market participants and expressed in market prices can under certain circumstances affect the so-called fundamentals that market prices are supposed to reflect. I call this two-way circular connection between market prices and the underlying reality reflexivity. I contend that financial markets are always reflexive and on occasion they can veer quite far away from the so-called equilibrium. In other words, it is an inherent characteristic of financial markets that they are prone to produce bubbles. 
I've originally proposed this theory in 1987, and I brought it up to date in my latest book, The New Paradigm for Financial Markets, The Credit Crisis of 2008, and What It Means. I have summarized my argument in the written testimony I have submitted. Let me recall briefly the main implications of the new paradigm for the regulation of financial markets. The first and foremost point is that the regulators must accept responsibility for controlling asset bubbles. Until now, they have explicitly rejected that responsibility. Second, to control asset bubbles is not enough to control the money supply. It's also necessary to control credit, because the two don't go uh, in lockstep. Third, controlling credit requires reactivating policy instruments which have fallen into disuse, notably margin requirements and minimum capital requirements for banks. When I say reactivate them, I mean that the ratios need to be changed from time to time to counteract the prevailing mood of the markets because markets do have moods. Fourth, new regulations are needed to ensure that margin requirements and the capital ratios of banks can be accurately measured. The alphabet soup of synthetic financial instruments, CDOs, CDSs, ETSs, and the like have made risks less apparent and harder to measure. These new products will have to be registered and approved before they can be used, and their clearing mechanism has to be regulated in order to minimize counterparty risk. Fifth, since financial markets are global, regulations must also be international in scope. Six, since the quantitative risk management models currently in use ignore the uncertainties inherent in reflexivity, limits on credit and leverage will have to be set substantially lower than those that have been incorporated in the Basel Accords on bank regulation. Basel II, which delegated authority for, for calculating risk to the financial institutions themselves, was an aberration and has to be abandoned. It needs to be replaced by a Basel III, which will be based on the new paradigm. How do these principles apply to hedge funds? Clearly, hedge funds use leverage, and they contribute to market instability in times like the present, when we are experiencing wholesale and disorderly deleveraging. Therefore, the systemic risks need to be recognized and more closely monitored than they have been until now. The entire regulatory framework needs to be reconsidered and hedge funds must need to be regulated within that framework. Excess, but we must beware of going overboard with regulation. Ex excessive deregulation is at the root of the current crisis and there is a real danger that the pendulum will swing too far the other way. That would be unfortunate, because regulations are liable to be even more deficient than the market mechanism itself. That's because regulators are not only human, but also bureaucratic and susceptible to political influence, influences. It has to be recognized that hedge funds were an integral part of the bubble, which has now burst. But the bubble, bubble has now burst, and hedge funds will be decimated. I would guess that the amount of money they manage will shrink between 50 and 75 percent. It would be a grave mistake to add to the forced liquidation currently depressing markets by ill-considered or punitive regulations. I'd be happy to expand on these points in greater detail in, in answering your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Soros. Uh, Mr. Simons? Oh, okay. Well, good morning, There's Chairman. There's a button on the base of the mic. Be sure to press it in and, and pull the mic closer. No, I think it's on. Okay, good. Is it on? Yeah. Good. Oh, Thanks. good morning again. 
uh, Chairman Waxman and Ranking Member Davis, members of the committee, I'm Jim Simons. I'm Chairman of Renaissance Technologies. And in my opinion, this series of hearings is, uh, is quite important. And I, uh, I appreciate your interest in trying to understand what this is all about. Now, in my view, this crisis has a number of causes. The regulators who took a hands-off position on investment bank leverage and credit default swaps. Everybody along the mortgage-backed securities chain who should have blown a whistle rather than passing the problem on. And in my opinion, the most culpable, the rating agencies, which in effect allowed sow's ears to be sold as silk purses. Before addressing the committee's questions, I'm going to say a little bit about myself and my company, because Renaissance is a somewhat atypical uh, investment management firm. Our approach is driven by my background as a mathematician. We manage funds whose trading is determined by mathematical formulas. We operate only in highly liquid, publicly traded securities, meaning we don't trade in credit default swaps or collateralized debt obligations or some of those alphabet soup things that George was just referring to. Our trading models actually tend to be contrarian, often buying stocks recently out of favor and selling those recently in favor. We manage three funds. Our flagship fund medallion accounts for nearly all of our income and is almost entirely owned by Renaissance employees. We charge ourselves fees, uh, which has the effect of shifting income away from the largest owners of the firm, like me, uh, to the rest of the employees. Our two new funds designed for institutional investors are both lightly leveraged and charge fees roughly half of those charged by most hedge funds. So I'll now turn to the, briefly to the questions that the committee asked. Do hedge funds cause systemic risk? Well, in my view, hedge funds were not a major contributor to the recent crisis. And generally, hedge funds have increased liquidity and reduced volatility in the markets. Moreover, because of their remarkably diverse strategies, hedge funds as a class are unlikely to create systemic risk, although it's not out of the question that they could. Hedge funds do use leverage. And, but here's an important point. Each hedge fund's leverage is, is controlled by its lenders, which is far more than one could say for investment banks. While the hedge funds require further regulation, I do think additional regulation focused on market integrity and stability will be useful, and I'll get back to that. Should hedge funds be registered with the SEC? Well, we've, we've always been registered, at least for 10 years, and we're certainly not opposed to an appropriate registration requirement. Should hedge funds be more transparent? Well, transparency to appropriate regulators can be helpful. And as Professor Rudder said very well, uh, described a uh, procedure, uh, which was also in my written uh, testimony, you may wish to consider requiring all market participants to report their positions to an appropriate regulator and then allowing the New York Fed to have access to aggregate position information and to recommend action if necessary. This is pretty much what, what Rudder said. I'll say it again. I stress, however, that the fund-specific information should not be released publicly, which could do more harm than good. Does the compensation structure of hedge funds lead to excessive risk-taking? Well, this question doesn't really apply to us, as almost all of our income is based on profits on our own capital. But generally speaking, I think not. The statistics bear this out to some extent. Compare the 7 percent annual volatility of the hedge fund index to the 15 percent annual volatility of the S&P over the last 10 years. Thus, hedge funds appear to be at least on the cautious side. Moreover, obviously there are exceptions. Moreover, typically a manager's largest investment is in his own fund. Is special tax treatment for hedge fund managers warranted? Well, I would only say that if Congress decides it's good policy to alter the tax treatment of carried interest, uh, that change should apply to all partnerships private equity, oil and gas, real estate, et cetera, all of which are based on that same principle, uh, not just hedge funds. And I personally would have no objection whatever to such a change. Uh, before concluding, I'd like to reflect on how we could help get out of this hole and make a proposal to prevent us getting back in. So I, I think that in the near term, the most important thing we can do 
is keep people in their homes, even if their mortgages are in default. This would help millions of families already coping with a tough economy and would maintain higher home values than would foreclosure. This would also mitigate losses on the securities collateralized by these mortgages. Now, there have been a number of proposals of how to do this, and I won't opine on which, uh, which is best. Uh, now, Mr. Chairman, uh, you mentioned in the, you had a hearing uh, on the failure of the uh, credit rating agencies, and I particularly appreciate your attention to that issue. See, I propose a new rating agency. Now, historically, the bond rating agencies were paid by the bond buyers, which was natural because it was them, it was they whom they were supposed to be serving. But in the 70s, when the agencies began to be paid uh, uh, by the bonds issuers, now despite the obvious conflict of interest, the new model worked okay with conventional type bonds, but until the advent of financially engineered products. Now I, even though I don't trade these products, uh, I believe in their value, I think they're good, but the organizations rating them must owe their allegiance to buyers, not to issuers. I therefore encourage the major holders of these bonds, such as CalPERS, TIAA, PIMCO, et cetera, to sponsor a new nonprofit rating agencies focused on derivative securities. Congress might consider chartering such an organization, having board representation from appropriate regulators. Revenues could come from buyer paid fees on each transaction, which I think would be minuscule. These complex instruments would then be subject to proper analysis and rating. The interests of buyers and raters would be aligned, and the likelihood of again seeing a problem like this one would be dramatically reduced. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Simons. Uh, Mr. Paulson. Chairman Waxman, Ranking Member Davis, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to appear today. Paulson & Co. is an investment advisory firm that was founded in 1994. We currently manage assets of approximately $36 billion using event-driven strategies. We are based in New York and also have offices in London and Hong Kong. We have approximately 70 employees. Is your, uh, there's a question whether your mic is on. There's a button on the base of the mic. Is it pressed or is it? All of the yes. investment funds we manage are open only to qualified purchasers, those with a minimum $5 million in investable assets if they are individuals and $25 million in investable assets if they are institutions. Our investors include pension funds, endowments, and foundations. These investors look to us to protect their capital and to show positive returns in both good and bad markets. We do this by going long securities that we think will rise in value and by going short securities that we think will decline in value. We have been able to operate profitably, profitably in 14 out of the last 15 years, including this year when the S&P is down over 40 percent. We believe that our ability to protect our investors' capital and generate positive returns over the long term is the reason we have grown to be one of the largest hedge funds in the world. Regarding compensation, we share profits with our investors on an 80-20 basis, where 80 percent of the profits go to the investors and 20 percent remains with us. We only earn performance allocations if our investors are profitable. All of our funds have a high water mark, which means that if we lose money for our investors, we have to earn it back before we share in future profits. Some of our funds also have a clawback provision, which requires us to return profits earned in prior periods if we lose money in subsequent periods. In addition, we invest our own money alongside that of our clients, so we share investment losses along with gains. We are a private company and have no public shareholders. We receive no taxpayer subsidies. All of our investors invest with us on a voluntary basis. We also use very little leverage. Over the past five years, for over half the time, our base portfolios were not funded with any borrowed money. 
and our maximum borrowing over the last five years as a percentage of equity capital was only 33 percent. In February 2004, we voluntarily registered with the SEC as an investment advisor. As a registered investment advisor, we are subject to periodic inspection, inspections, focused reviews, and ad hoc requests for information. We are also subject to stringent record keeping requirements and have to file information regularly with the SEC. We comply with all rules and regulations, not only in the U.S., but in each of the over 15 countries where we invest. As Americans, we are proud of the leadership position the United States occupies in this industry, the jobs our industry has created, the export earnings we have produced for our country, and the taxes we generate for the Treasury. For example, over the last five years, our firm has increased our employee count by 10 times, creating numerous high-paying jobs for Americans. In addition, 80 percent of our assets under management come from foreign investors. The revenues we receive from foreign investors allows us to contribute to the U.S. economy like an exporter of goods, bringing in money from abroad. In 2005, our firm became very concerned about weak credit underwriting standards, excessive leverage amongst financial institutions, and a fundamental mispricing of credit risk. To protect our investors against the risk in the financial markets, we purchased protection through credit default swaps on debt securities we thought would decline in value. As credit spreads, spreads widened and the value of these securities fell, we realized substantial gains for our investors. We have offered suggestions on the causes of the credit crisis and what the U.S. Government can do to help the situation. I also have some recommendations on how future purchases of preferred stock under the TARP can be structured both to protect taxpayers better and to provide greater stability to financial institutions. And I would be pleased to share those thoughts with you. Again, thank you for the opportunity to address this committee. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Paulson. Mr. Falcon. <clears throat> thank you, Chairman Ra Waxman, Ranking Member Davis, and other members of the committee. My name is Philip Falcone. I am the Senior Managing Director and Co-Founder of the Harbinger Capital Partners Funds. I am extremely proud of the work that we have done at Harbinger. Year in, year out, we have generated substantial returns for our investors, which include pension funds, endowments, and charitable foundations. We have achieved our success for our investors by doing things the right way. Through our investments, we have also provided much-needed need, much capital to American companies, supporting them as they pursue their business plans and giving them a second chance to reach their potential. I appreciate the, the committee holding today's hearing in order to learn more about hedge funds and their positive role in the financial markets. I am hopeful that this committee can take four points away from today's testimony. Number one. Compensation in the hedge fund industry is performance-based. I think that is the right way to do business because it creates incentive for hard work and innovation. Number two, hedge funds use a variety of investment strategies, including traditional approaches. Investors, especially large institutions, want a broad array of strategies and disciplines so they can diversify their portfolios. Number three, Short selling is a valuable, long-standing feature of our markets. It isn't short selling that puts companies out of business, but rather over-levered balance sheets, poor management decisions, and flawed business plans. Number four, I support greater transparency and better reporting in the hedge fund sector. I would like to take a moment to tell you a little bit about myself. I currently reside in New York City with my wife of 11 years and two children. By way of background, I was born in Chisholm, Minnesota, population 5,000, on the Iron Range of northern Minnesota. I was the youngest of nine kids who grew up in a three-bedroom home in a working-class neighborhood. My father was a utility superintendent and never made more than $15,000 per year, while my mother worked in the local shirt factory. 
<laughs> the point of all this is I take great pride in my upbringing and it is important for the committee and the public to know that not everyone who runs a hedge fund was born on Fifth Avenue. That is the beauty of America and the, and the, and the beauty of the potential in our industry. Through hard work and perhaps a little bit of luck, Harbinger Par Capital Partners has been able to generate substantial returns for our investors since 2001. Our investment philosophy is very simple. We study, often for months, the fundamentals of companies to identify those that are undervalued or overvalued, and we act decisively when opportunities present themselves. We are not momentum traders, nor are we day traders. We are investors. It is not magic. My analysts perform thorough due diligence rather than relying on ratings agencies or other research reports like many of the, the reports that improperly valued securitized mortgage products over the past few years. My compensation is based upon the returns that we generate for our investors, which have far exceeded the performance of the overall market. There is no doubt that as a result of the success of Harbinger Funds, I have done extremely well financially. But this is not the case where management takes huge bonuses or stock options while the company is failing. My success is tied to that of my investors, and I have reinvested a substantial portion of my compensation over the years back into the funds alongside my investors, who are fully aware of the compensation formula when deciding whether to place their money with us. Because of the events of the past few months, the American public, including my investors, have just about justifiable concerns about our financial markets and the economy. The important thing to remember, however, is that we must keep things in perspective and not over overreact, misperceive, or misrepresent what has happened. We are a resilient society. society. We must focus on the positives and continue taking the proper steps forward rather than backward. Hedge funds play an important role in the, in the economy by providing needed capital and encouraging creativity and outside-the-box thinking. Many viable companies struggling under a huge debt load or poor cash flow have not only survived but flourished through an infusion of hedge fund capital, saving thousands of jobs. I am proud of Harbinger's cap track record of helping these types of companies emerge from bankruptcy and helping others avoid filing in the first place. Finally, I would like to offer a thought or two on how Congress and the hedge fund industry can work together to increase public confidence not only in our industry but in the financial markets as a whole. I support some additional government regulation requiring more public disclosure and transparency for hedge funds as well as for public companies. All investors, whether individuals or sophisticated institutions, have a right to know what assets companies have an interest in, whether on or off their balance sheets, and what those assets are really worth. I also support the creation of a public exchange or clearinghouse for derivatives trading, especially credit default swaps. An open and transparent market for these transactions would reduce confusion and improve understanding as well as help with valuation issues. In summary, while I was growing up, my family may have lacked money, but one thing we didn't lack was integrity and pride in what we did and how we did it. It was the cornerstone then, and it remains the cornerstone of my family and my business today. In 1990, one of my investors once told me something that continues to resonate with me today. He said, I can't guarantee that if you work hard, you will be successful, but I can guarantee that if you don't work hard, you won't be successful. You won't be successful. We should never lose sight of that. Needless to say, I love this country and am grateful for the opportunity that I have been provided. That being said, we are living in difficult times now. Consequently, I hope that this committee and indeed the entire nation will look at the hedge fund industry as part of the solution to our economic turmoil. Given the tighten, tightening of credit markets, access, access to capital is more important than ever, and I believe that hedge funds can and should be a source for this capital. Thank you for permitting me the opportunity to make this statement, and I would be happy to answer questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Falcon. Mr. Griffin. Mr. Chairman, Congressman Davis, and distinguished members of the committee, my name is Kenneth Griffin, and I am the founder and CEO of Citadel Investment Group. Thank you for the opportunity to address this committee. Today, our nation is working through the worst financial crisis since the 1930s. 
It is imperative that we as a nation continue to take actions to mitigate the impact of the credit crisis on our broader economy in the hopes of keeping Americans employed and productive. I appreciate your leadership on this important undertaking. I am proud that in the 18 years since I founded Citadel, it has grown into a financial institution of great strength and capability. With a team of over 1,400 talented individuals, Citadel manages approximately $15 billion of investment capital for a broad array of institutional investors, high net worth individuals, and Citadel's employees. Citadel's capital market division plays an important role in our nation's financial markets. Our broker dealer is the largest market maker in options in the United States, executing approximately 30 percent of all equity option trades daily. In addition, Citadel accounts for nearly 10 percent of the daily trading volume of U.S. equities. All businesses take risk. In some industries, we refer to risk taking as research and development. At financial institutions, we often take risk by investing in securities. Failure to understand and manage risk can be severe, as we have seen far too often in recent weeks. Although the financial crisis has affected virtually every participant in the financial markets, including Citadel, I believe that Citadel's constant and consistent focus on risk management has been a key asset in successfully navigating this financial crisis and will continue to serve us well in the years to come. In this crisis, the concept of too interconnected to fail has replaced the concept of too big to fail. The rapid growth in the use of derivatives has created an opaque market whose outstanding notional value is measured in the hundreds of trillions of dollars. As a result, there is great concern about the systemic effects of the failure of any one financial institution. In the area of credit default swaps, for example, there is an estimated $55 trillion of outstanding notional contracts between market participants. This number is almost four times the GDP of our nation. The creation of central clearinghouses to act as intermediaries and guarantors of financial derivatives, such as credit default swaps, represents a straightforward solution to the issues inherent in today's opaque, over-the-counter market. Of greatest importance, such a clearinghouse will dramatically reduce systemic risk, allowing us to step away from the too interconnected to fail paradigm. Numerous other benefits will accrue to our economy. Regulators, for example, will have far greater transparency into this vast and important market. In recent months, Citadel and the CME Group have partnered in building such a clearinghouse for credit default swaps. Our solution is an example of how industry, in cooperation with regulators, can solve complex market problems. I believe and have said before that our financial markets work best when they are competitive, fair, and transparent. Proper regulation is critical. But the best regulation is created with an eye towards unleashing opportunities, not limiting possibilities. To achieve this, Congress, regulators, and industry must all work together. Our markets are complex, and they must be well understood if they are to be well regulated. We must solve the serious issues we face, but not in a way that stifles the best innovative qualities of our great capital markets. I thank the committee for holding this hearing today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Griffin. We are now going to proceed to questions by members of the panel who will each have uh, five minutes uh, each. Uh, I want to remind the members that the he hearing today is about hedge funds and the financial markets and questions about other uh, topics are not relevant to the hearing. The Chair won't bar any member from asking any particular question or a witness from answering 
a particular question, but witnesses uh, will not be required to answer questions unrelated to the topic of today's hearing. So I urge members and witnesses to keep their questions and answers focused on the topic of today's hearing. I'm going to start with myself. Let me uh, start off by asking about systemic risk. In 1998, there was the long-term capital management. It was one of the nation's largest hedge funds. It had about $5 billion in capital and was leveraged at a ratio of 30 to 1. It had made investments worth about $150 billion. And when those investments went bad, its capital was quickly wiped out. The Federal Reserve became so concerned about the broader impacts of this collapse that it organized a multi-billion dollar bailout. That was in 1998, when only about 3,000 hedge funds manage approximately $200 billion in assets. Current estimates suggest that there may now be more than 9,000 hedge funds managing assets worth more than $2 trillion. Some say hedge funds have become a shadow banking system. So I'd like to ask each of you uh, two questions. Do you believe that the collapse of large hedge funds could pose systemic risks to the economy? And if so, do you believe this justifies greater federal regulation? Mr. So Soros, why don't we start with you and we'll go straight down the line. <coughs> yes, I think that uh, some hedge funds uh, do pose a systemic risk. Uh, and I think uh, particularly uh, leveraged capital was built on a false conception. Um, I talked about the uh, false paradigm that on which our financial system has been built, and uh, that was actually Im embodied in leveraged capital, uh, which was uh, uh, very, uh, which basically assumed that deviations from are, are um, uh, random. Do you and believe this justifies greater federal uh, regulation? Pardon? Do you believe this justifies uh, greater federal regulation? Uh, yes, uh, uh, it does. Okay, thank you. Mr. Simons? Yeah, well, uh, certainly the Is your mic on? Yeah, it is. Okay. Certainly the possibility exists that, uh, that an individual hedge fund or hedge funds in aggregate uh, could cause, uh, be a cause of systemic risk. Uh, and uh, I think that the regulation in the form of uh, reporting up to uh, the SEC, for example, uh, uh, in, in a more detailed manner than uh, is presently done, uh, with those things aggregated, that information aggregated, passed on to the uh, Federal Reserve or, or some such, would be uh, uh, would be a good approach. Uh, so, yes. Thank you, Mr. Paulson. I, I think the risk is your is button is your button pressed on the mic. Yes, okay. I think the the systemic risk in in the financial system, and that includes hedge funds as well as banks and other financial institutions, is due to too much leverage that when banks or hedge funds use too much leverage, you only need a small decline in the value of the assets before the equity is wiped out, wiped out and the debt is impaired. I do think uh, there's, a, there's a need for more stringent leverage requirements on banks, financial institutions, and where necessary on hedge funds. Uh, the, the amount of common equity that, that institutions are operating with is simply too thin to support their balance sheets. The primary reasons why financial firms have run into trouble, whether it's Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns, or AIG, is they have way too much leverage. Uh, Lehman Brothers, as an example, uh, had over 40 times the assets compared to their tangible common equity. They just didn't have enough equity. If hedge funds use, uh, an, every hedge fund that's had a problem uh, whether it was the Carlisle funds, the Bear Stearns funds, or even long-term capital before, was because of the use of too much leverage. Do you think, therefore, that there ought to be more government regulation on the, uh, uh, of the hedge that, funds, and particularly yeah, on leverage? Yes, I think that the equity requirements of financial institutions need to be raised, and the margin requirements, the amount of capital uh, 
institutions or investors have to hold to support individual securities should also be raised. And by doing that, that would reduce the risk in the system. Okay. Thank you very much. I may Mr. add just one point is that yeah. in all the trillions of government support globally to try and stem this financial disaster, not one dollar yet has been used to support a hedge fund. Uh, so the, the, the problems uh, have been with our, Wall with our investment banks, with other financial institutions. And although long-term capital was large, as $4 billion hedge fund, uh, that problem was also solved privately without any government intervention. And the, the problems in long-term capital, which today was the largest hedge fund to experience a problem, are minuscule compared to the $150 billion that was required to bail out AIG, the $700 billion in the TAR program, <coughs> or even the $139 billion that was just uh, advanced to GE in the form of uh, guarantees. Good point. Thank you, Mr. Foucault. Yes, I think that uh, any institution that has a pool of capital at its availability and uses reckless leverages indeed uh, poses a systemic, potential systemic risk to the marketplace. Um, I think that uh, when you look at the hedge fund industry um, with the trillion or trillion and a half dollars outstanding, that uh, the, the, the leverage aspect of it is a bit isolated. Um, and there are certain institutions that, that may pose risks, but I would suspect that for the most part the industry in general is not nearly as levered as some of the banking institutions that we were dealing with over the past um, um, four or five months. And I do support additional regulation as it relates to that because I don't think it's in anybody's best interest to see these institutions unravel um, and create a domino effect. Thank you. Mr. Griffin. Mr. Chairman, as you referred to long-term capital's consortium bailout in 1998, it is important to remember it was a private market solution to a very challenging problem. Just a few years ago, Citadel and J.P. Morgan created a private market solution to the challenges faced by Amaranth and its shareholders when they incurred even greater losses in the natural gas market. Private market solutions can address crises. And we should keep in the center of our minds that we want to foster private market solutions as the way that we handle crises first and foremost. Of second point, hedge funds are already regulated indirectly by the fact that the banking system is regulated and the banking system is the primary extender of credit to hedge funds. And last but not least, I think it's important that we keep in mind it's very convenient to say we should simply have more equity in the system. But equity is very expensive. And if we wish to reduce the cost of loans to consumers and loans to homeowners, we need to think of capital structures that have the right mix of equity to debt. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the uh, private market solution was organized by the Fed, so it wasn't without some public intervention. But you, is it your conclusion that we do need some greater federal regulation of I hedge do funds because of the systemic risks? No. It is not my belief okay. that we need greater government regulation of hedge funds okay. with respect to the systemic risks they create. Okay. And to be very direct, we have gone through a financial tsunami in the last few weeks. And if we look at where the failure stress points have been in the system, they have been in the regulated institutions, whether it is AIG, an insurance company, mm -hmm. Fannie or Freddie, the banking system. We have not seen hedge funds as a focal point of carnage in this recent financial tsunami. Okay. Well, uh, our expert witness in the first panel uh, testified they believe hedge funds do pose systemic risk. Uh, former SEC Chairman David Reuter said this, highly leveraged hedge funds that borrow large sums and engage in complex transactions using exotic derivative instruments may severely disrupt the financial markets if they are unable to meet counterparty obligations or must sell assets in order to repay investors. And Professor Andrew Lowe gave a similar testimony. And my concern is that our regulatory system has not recognized these potential risks. The hedge fund industry is getting bigger. The systemic risks are growing larger. And yet Federal regulators have virtually no oversight of your industry. And that is a potentially dangerous situation. So I appreciate it. 
hearing each of your views on that subject. Mr. Davis. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, I would ask them, let me just amplify your question and then they can answer the question you just posed because our first uh, panel witness did propose requiring hedge funds to divulge comprehensive risk uh, information to regulators. But I have heard some concern here and elsewhere that uh, the need to keep such data in an aggregated and confidential format. And so I would ask, uh, along with Mr. Waxman's question, is there a danger of too much transparency in the hedge fund industry and what is that? So, Mr. Griffin, I will start with you. I think you have some limits on regulation and ask you to address that. And then I will move right down the so on the issue of disclosure of positions or aggregate risk factors, we would at Citadel not be adverse to that so long as the information was maintained confidential and in the hands of the regulators. To ask us to disclose our positions to the open market would parallel asking Coca-Cola to disclose their secret formula to the world. Okay. Trump. I agree. I think that it is important to uh, disclose the information to the, to, to the appropriate regulatory agencies. Uh, we work long and hard in developing our ideas and to make them public um, I don't think is the right thing to do. And uh, the public would not necessarily use them um, in the same way, shape or form that we would use our ideas. Mr. Paulson. Yes. Uh, as you know, we voluntarily uh, registered with the SEC in 19, uh, is, your, is your mic on? Uh, as you know, we voluntarily registered uh, with the SEC in 2004. Uh, we believe to the extent uh, uh, having a regulatory oversight over the policies uh, of hedge funds to the extent it provides uh, greater a comfort to the uh, public sector and to private investors is a uh, beneficial uh, thing. Yeah, I don't have much to add. I have already said I think reporting up to the regulators is a good idea. Uh, more so than is now reported. I agree with the others that uh, it should stay with the regulators or with the Federal Reserve. It shouldn't be uh, so put into the that. New York Times. As, as I have said, uh, I think the regulators need to monitor positions more closely than they have done until now. But disclosing it to the public can be very harmful uh, in many ways. And I think that the uh, publication of short positions, for instance, uh, practically endangered the business model of long short equity investors. Uh, it's not our business, it's the other hedge funds that do that. Uh, because of the reaction of, of the companies uh, whose shares they were selling short. Okay. Let me ask this a little off. I asked uh, Mr. Waxman, he's comfortable with me asking this. Um, do you have any opinions on what the Treasury Department is doing now with the Troubled Asset Recovery Plan, uh, how they could deploy that maybe better than they are doing? It is uh, in light of the fact that the $700 billion is not actually being used to buy up troubled assets, but rather to purchase equity stakes in financial firms. Uh, Secretary Paulson has indicated the Treasury may even start purchasing stakes in non-bank financial firms. And do you think any hedge funds uh, might take advantage of such an offer? And any one want to opine a, an opinion on that? I will start, Mr. Griffin, with you. And uh, Congressman Davis, I believe that the decision to focus on injecting equities or equity or preferred equity into the banking system versus buying assets will create a larger effect for all of us and is a good decision on a relative basis. So in other words, I applaud yeah, sure. Secretary of Treasury for making the decision to increase the equity capital base of the banking system at this moment in time. Of course, we have a difficult decision to make ahead of us. Do we expand TARP to include the non-banking sector? And if we do so, where do we draw the line? I think that is a very difficult decision that we have to make in the weeks and months ahead. Obviously, the economy as a whole is slowing down, and we need to keep Americans employed. And I believe that we are going to need more stimulus packages to keep our economy as close to full potential as possible. I have been in favor of um, TARP to a certain extent, um, considering that it could be a safety net for isolated incident incidents. 
I don't believe, however, that uh, the uh, money should be used for random purchasing of assets because of the uh, lack of clarity as it relates to what the, the institutions will do with that capital and, and, and what benefits it will do for the uh, individual consumer. Um, and I furthermore do not think that it should go above and beyond the financial institutions. Okay. Uh, Congressman Davis, I, I do think it was a, uh, a tremendous improvement shifting the focus of TARP from buying assets, which has very little impact on uh, recapitalizing banks, to directly buying equity. I think the problem in the financial sector is one of solvency. Uh, financial firms don't have enough equity, and injecting equity is the solution to the problem. I also think the uh, list of uh, recipients needs to be expanded to include other types of financial firms whose failure could pose systemic risk. That may include auto finance companies, other finance companies, and insurance companies. However, I do think the structure of TARP investments can be improved. I think the, the current terms are overly generous to the recipients. And I'll give you some examples. When, when uh, Berkshire Hathaway uh, bought preferred stock in, in one of the investment banks, they received a 10 percent dividend and warrants equal to 100 percent of the value of the investment. Uh, under the TAR program, the yield was only 5 percent and warrants equal to only 15 percent. In the U.K. and Switzerland, when they invested preferred stock in their financial companies, they got a 12 percent yield, also substantial uh, equity uh, stakes. Uh, by, by investing proceeds at less than market rates and less than other, other governments are doing, it is in effect an indirect transfer of wealth from the taxpayers to these financial institutions. In addition, in the U.K., Switzerland, and all other governments, when government money was required to help out financial institutions, there were restrictions on common dividends and on executive compensation. In the U.K. and in Switzerland, as long as government money is inside these companies, there are pro prohibitions on the payment of common dividends and <coughs> caps on executive compensation. And this is essential in order to increase the retained earnings and common equities of the banks. Uh, it doesn't seem to make sense to me that the banks are short of capital, the government puts in capital, and then that capital comes out the other door in the forms of dividends and compensation. I would make two suggestions uh, that I think should be required of any financial firms that receive preferred stock investments or any form of guarantee from the Federal Government on their debt or other securities. One would be, while that guarantee is outstanding or while the preferred investment is made, that cash common dividends be eliminated and any dividends be restricted to dividends in additional shares of common stock. Secondly, as other governments have required, there should be restrictions on cash compensation and any bonuses or payments above that amount should be paid in common stock. By making those three adjustments, first increasing the terms of the uh, preferred in terms of yield and equity to benefit the taxpayer, second eliminating cash dividends, and third capping executive compensation that would both protect taxpayers and restore the badly needed equity capital to these institutions. Okay. Well, uh, it was generally uh, agreed that the original goal of TARP uh, to buy some of this uh, paper uh, was perhaps not the best idea and more leverage would be created by uh, capitalizing the banks and so on. So on the other hand, and I, I more or less agree with that, but nonetheless, Something has to be done about this paper. Uh, no one knows what much of it is worth, and it's uh, it's in weak hands. Uh, people don't know how to, you know, the, uh, appraise the balance sheets of the companies that are holding it, and so on. So it is a problem, and it's a big problem. I, I had suggested to uh, Bob Steele when he was uh, Under Secretary of the Treasury that the 
that rather than buy this stuff, they organize an auction, a two-sided auction, dividing the paper up into various categories and so on and, and, and conducting auctions that people could buy and sell and hopefully buyers would come in and sellers would put up and uh, the market would kind of get cleared. Uh, it's a it's a pretty good idea, but it's a dangerous one because the <coughs> prices might not be uh, make some folks very happy. Uh, people who maybe aren't selling, but all of a sudden their balance sheets get whacked way down. So, but sooner or later we have to face the question: What is this stuff worth, and how do we get it out of weak hands, where much of it is, and into strong hands? And uh, because only with the paper being in strong hands. Uh, can the issues, some of these issues, be dealt with? Uh, if a mortgage is chopped up into a million pieces and owned uh, fractions of, it or, of its cash flow is owned by all kinds of people, it's, not, it's very hard to deal with that homeowner and renegotiate the terms. But if you've bought this mortgage at, okay, a discount, then you can go uh, to the fellow, and I'm cause projecting this on a much wider scale, and say, okay, you know, you can't make your monthly payments, but could you make it half? And can we, can, we, can we make a deal here? A and because he or she bought this paper at a sub substantial discount, everyone can make out okay uh, in a reduced way. Somehow or other, that paper has to be dealt with. And, uh, uh, and that's all I have to say. Uh, I'm on record in being very critical of the original uh, top proposal. And I'd like to go on record saying that while it is a great improvement that it's not used for, uh, for uh, uh, removing toxic securities but uh, uh, for equity injection, the way it is done is not, a, 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 not an a, a adequate or acceptable way, that if it were properly done, then $700 billion would be more than sufficient to replenish the uh, gaping hole in the, in the banking system and to encourage uh, the banks uh, to start lending again. And the way that this, could, this should be done would be to ask the examiners to, to, to uh, uh, determine how much capital each bank needs to bring it up to the required 8%. Then the, the banks would be free to raise that capital or go to TARP and get a, a, an offer, and, but TARP should only underwrite the issue and not actually take it on, uh, but underwrite it on terms that the shareholders would be likely to take it on. And only if the shareholders don't take it would TARP uh, take it on. Uh, then uh, you would have replenished the, the uh, banking system. You would then reduce the minimum lending requirements from 8%, let's say, to 6%, the minimum, uh, the minimum capital requirements. And the, uh, the banks would be very anxious to put that very expensive capital, because uh, equity capital is expensive, uh, to good, good use, to good, uh, get a good return on it by actually uh, lending. So that would solve that problem. And as far as the toxic securities are concerned, I think the first thing is to, to uh, renegotiate the mortgages so that, that uh, people would actually stay in their houses and re remove the pressure of, of uh, foreclosures, which are liable to push down the value of mortgage securities way below that. That, that, that is an undone business that has to be urgently atten attended to. Okay. Thank you all. Let me tell my colleague, he has no time to yield back. <laughs> 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 Definitely. Let me um, just ask a question and just go right down the line and get an answer from each of you. Uh, all of you have <laughs> successfully navigated uh, the recent problems in the economy which appears to have blindsided the people on Wall Street and of course the people here in Washington. I don't think we can pass up this opportunity to explore what it is that you knew that allowed you to get so far ahead of everyone else when it came to predicting what would happen in the markets. I, I would like to go right down the line. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Right down the line. Let me just start with you, Mr. Griffin. Go right down the line. 
So the last eight weeks have been a challenging eight weeks for Citadel. We've had a very successful 18 years holistically, but we've had a tough time the last eight weeks as the banking system around the world came close to the verge of collapsing. I think what's very important to note is what has happened in the last eight weeks looks like nothing that any of the traditional risk management metrics would have shown as a realistic possibility. I think it's very important for everyone to keep in mind in terms of policy decisions on a going forward basis. We had a panic in the money market system, we had a panic in the banking system, and we've had very negative consequences as a result of that in the entire Western world's financial system. I think if we look at the firms that have done well over the last eight weeks, they came into this position with portfolios of both credit risk and equity market risk that could tolerate extreme moves, which we have witnessed. And they have come into this crisis with very solid financing lines, which have been important in terms of weathering the storm that we have just gone through. Mm -hmm. Mr. Falcone. I think in looking at uh, what has happened over the past eight weeks versus what has happened over, the, over um, the previous history in the financial markets is a very unique point in time. Um, the markets are very irrational right now. And I've always said you could be right fundamentally and wrong technically, and there, the technical situation in the marketplace is putting a lot of pressure on a lot of institutions. Um, how we've weathered the, the storm and how we've done over the past has really been a function of our diligence. And I think um, in, in looking at where we've been successful, we've taken our time and been methodical and re really thought things through. And we were very involved in the mortgage market over the past couple of years, and it's been to a point, it was to a point where it took me about uh, 8 to 12 months of uh, some pretty substantial analysis before we put uh, that, that trade on or trades like that on. So I would say that over the past um, couple of months, it uh, again has been very irrational and uh, very, been very difficult to avoid. Um, no matter what type of institution you are, to avoid the, the pitfalls of what's been taking place, and uh, I think in order to um, to, su to succeed going forward, um, the proper liquidity and the proper lines with the right institutions are uh, a very critical and very important thing. Right, Mr. Paulson. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we we conduct a, a lot of uh, detailed uh, analysis independent. Of the rating agencies, and yes, uh, our firm conducts a lot of uh, detailed, independent research uh, that's independent of what the rating agencies do, and we determined late in 2005 and early 2006 that there was a complete mispricing of risk of mortgage securities. Uh, we found Moody, Moody's and S&P rating various securities investment grade, including as high as AAA, that we thought would become worthless. The reason we had this opinion was we looked at the underlying collateral of these securities. Uh, the subprime, subprime securities were comprised of mortgages that were made with 100 percent financing and no down payment. They were made to borrowers that had a history of poor credit. There was no income verification, and the mortgage value was based on an appraisal that was typically inflated. We felt this was very poor underwriting quality, that the default rates in these mortgages would be very high, and that securities backed by these mortgages would also like very high, likely also have very high defaults. And it was that analysis that allowed us to uh, uh, to buy protection on these securities, which resulted in large gains for our funds. Thank you. Mr. Simon? Okay. Well, I didn't have uh, that kind of uh, wisdom. Uh, happily, uh, the funds that we uh, operate didn't, didn't require that kind of wisdom. Uh, so our principal fund, uh, which is called Medallion, is long and short equal amounts of equity and is not necessarily affected by the rises and falls in the stock market and, in fact, has done, has done fine through this period. Uh, a second fund, uh, which is designed to be a dollar long, that is for outsiders, not employees, um, 
Uh, obviously, has uh, it's it's long more than it's short, so it's net long a dollar if you invest a dollar. That has obviously had some declines. The stock market down 40 percent, but considerably less than the declines uh, uh, of the market. And our investors in that fund are are quite happy because that's what they uh, uh, that's what we advertised would happen, and that's so that's fine. Uh, uh, an outside futures fund we have. Uh, was hurt by the explosion of volatility in October. Uh, I couldn't have predicted that. Maybe I should have. I didn't. It was on the wrong side of a few things and suffered some losses in October. But by and large, um, our business is not uh, highly correlated with the, with the stock market. And uh, so that's how we skated along here. Uh, was Mr. your Stolers. question, I didn't fully understand your question, was it to, uh, how it affected our yes, and uh, how, how you seem to have been able to anticipate yes. when others didn't were not able to anticipate, especially well, to the Wall I mean, Street and, and Washington. Uh, I fully anticipated the worst financial crisis since the 1930s, but frankly, what has happened in the last eight weeks uh, <laughs> exceeded uh, my expectations. Uh, the uh, the fact that uh, Lehman Brothers was allowed to uh, uh, go um, uh, declare bankruptcy uh, in a disorderly way uh, really caused a meltdown, a genuine meltdown of the financial system with a cardiac arrest. Um, and uh, the authorities have been involved since then in resuscitating the system. Uh, but it has been a tremendous shock, uh, the, the impact of which has not yet been fully, fully um, uh, felt. Now, as far as uh, my own fund is concerned, I came out of retirement to preserve my capital. And uh, I've succeeded in doing that. Uh, so we are f uh, flat on the, for the year uh, because uh, by taking the necessary steps, I was able to counterbalance uh, the losses that we would be suffering otherwise, which would be quite substantial. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all of you for your uh, answers. A gentleman from Indiana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I understand this is a financial hearing and I'm not going to get into other questions, but I just want to say, Mr. Soros, we've had deep disagreements over the years on uh, the heroin needles promotions and your uh, promotion of different uh, what I believe are backdoor legalization of marijuana. And I believe you've, uh, while you've done uh, uh, humanitarian efforts around the world, your uh, intervention in the drug area has been uh, appalling. And I, I haven't had the chance to uh, talk to you directly and I wanted to uh, say that because I believe it's uh, damaged many Americans and I hope you'll reevaluate where you've put your money. But I do have a, a question directly to you on your, on your uh, question on uh, equilibrium, <clears throat> that don't hedge funds provide some of that equilibrium by buying long and selling short and going after companies that haven't been responsible? And why do you think there wasn't more of that in this case? Well, to, to, to some extent, uh, uh, hedge funds do. And of course, we shouldn't uh, put all the hedge funds in one category. They are different strategies and, uh, and um, they have different effects. And uh, definitely, uh, uh, selling short uh, is a, a stabilizing factor. Uh, generally speaking, in in the market, you know, there's markets that uh, that uh, allow um, and facilitate short selling uh, tend to be more stable than those that prohibit them. Uh, at the same time, uh, hedge funds do use uh, leverage, and uh, leverage, by by its very nature, uh, has the potential. Of, of being destabilizing, uh, because uh, uh, as the uh, price, as the market goes up, the value of the collateral increases. You can borrow more, and uh, also 
maybe your appetite, since you are making profits, your appetite for borrowing more is increasing, so there's greater willingness to lend on the, by, the, by the banks. So this is the, generally speaking, uh, bubbles always involve credit. And since uh, hedge funds use credit, they are contributors uh, to, to the bubbles. Uh, it's nothing specific to hedge funds. It's, it, it relates to everyone who uses credit. Mr. Paulson, uh, you uh, said a little bit <clears throat> ago that you fe felt that the government need to get, needed to get more involved in the uh, fact that some use too much leverage and that uh, it's kind of a slippery slope because, uh, as Mr. Soros just uh, suggested, that uh, in fact hedge funds use some leverage as well. And in fact, while you serve a function for equilibrium, you often exaggerate the extremes of that uh, through selling short or buying long. Um, how could you respond some to what Mr. Soros said? How do you feel? Uh, do you still feel you shouldn't have additional regulation with that? Uh, and uh, if and how do you respond to the fact that you, you you do in fact exaggerate some of these trends? Well, I think what what leverage does is it exacerbates any move. Your mic on, sir. Yeah, it just needs to yeah. closer. The, the 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 danger of leverage is that it exacerbates any type of market move. So almost every financial firm that has run into problems not only uh, hedge funds like long-term capital, but Lehman Brothers, AIG, has because they use too much leverage. And a small decline in the uh, value of their assets wiped out their equity. So I think that the, there is a need uh, to raise the margin requirements on particular asset classes and to require uh, stronger equity positions in banks so that uh, the, 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 and that would reduce the risk of failure. Mr. Griffin, you've been the most aggressive in saying that there shouldn't be regulation. How would you respond to the other comments there? Well, let me, let me be very direct on the point of regulation. Good regulation is good for every market participant. I mean, for example, in the middle of this financial crisis, we worked hand in hand with the SEC to create the necessary exemptions to allow Citadel to continue to make markets every day in options to millions of retail investors. And every day during this crisis, we have provided liquidity in the equities markets to millions of retail investors, whether they are at Schwab or Fidelity or Ameritrade or E-Trade. I am very proud of my firm's commitment to providing liquidity to retail investors in America. We have also worked hand in hand with the Federal Reserve Bank of New York on creating a clearinghouse for, central, for credit default swaps. I think that as a nation, we need an intelligent dialogue about the right regulatory frameworks to encourage markets that are transparent, that have the appropriate amount of leverage in the system, and that create value for society. The point of our capital markets is to allocate capital efficiently to allow corporate America to raise equity, to grow, and to allow America to be more competitive in the world markets. And any regulation that furthers those key goals of our capital markets is regulation I would support. Okay. May I ask it? Be fine. Would, would, if regulation goes too far, would your funds, because I assume you all have foreign investment, would we see this move offshore? either to Europe or Asia or other places? It breaks my heart when I go to Canary Wharf and I look at the thousands and thousands of highly paid jobs in London in the derivatives markets that belong in America. We went through a period of regulatory uncertainty with respect to derivatives that pushed thousands of high paying jobs abroad, jobs that belonged in our country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Gentlewoman from New York. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I uh, would like to ask uh, 
A question about a specific uh, regulatory proposal, uh, which is to require hedge funds to disclose information uh, to regulators. This is an idea that was pro proposed in the prior panel by both Mr. Rutter and Professor Loeb. Um, right now, the SEC, the Fed, and other entities have virtually no information about hedge funds. As a result, they have very limited ability to assess uh, systemic risk. As Professor Lowe testified, one cannot uh, manage what one cannot measure. He said that it is, and I quote, obvious and indisputable need to require financial institutions to provide additional data to regulators. Uh, Chairman Rutter made the same point when he said, and I quote, I continue to believe that a system should be created requiring hedge funds to divulge to regulators information regarding the size, nature of their risk positions, and the identities of their, con of their counterparties. And I see you have your book with you, Mr. Soros. And in your book, uh, you said, and I quote from you, there are systemic risks that need to be managed by the regulatory authorities. To be able to do so, they must have adequate information. The participants, including hedge funds and sovereign wealth funds and other unregulated entities must provide that information even if it is costly and cumbersome. The costs pale into insignificance when compared to the cost of a breakdown. And we are now experiencing a major uh, breakdown. And so, Mr. Soros, would you support a requirement uh, for hedge funds to report uh, financial information to regulators? Yes. And, and uh, Mr. Simon, uh, you also in your testimony, testimony made a similar statement uh, uh, about transparency and, and appropriate regulation. Uh, so would you agree also that it's uh, correct to have more? Yep. And um, I, I uh, uh, also, Mr. Paulson, Mr. Falcon, and Mr. Griffin, would you support additional information and transparency to regulators? Congress Maloney make a very good argument. I think given the size of the industry and the potential for systematic risk, such dis I, uh, 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 I'm having me. trouble hearing you. Congressman Maloney, I think you make a very good argument that given the size of the industry and the potential for systemic risk, a greater disclosure and transparency would be warranted. Uh, Mr. Falcon? I, I, I agree. I think providing um, information to the regulatory agencies is very important. I think, however, it is very critical what they do with that information and um, that we have to make sure that it is properly an analyzed. And I think that can go a long way as opposed to providing the information and just seeing it filed away. And Mr. Griffin? I think one of the challenges that we need to address before we can get to the goals that you want to get to is to have a common language to describe derivatives. That's important. Every firm uses a different set of terminologies, a different set of representations to describe their derivatives portfolios. Until we create central clearing houses for over-the-counter derivatives, any reporting that we are likely to create will be inscrutable to regulators. And well, we, we are need to moving fix that. towards that direction, as you have read and know the Fed is moving in that direction. Uh, Mr. Paulson, I would uh, like to uh, ask you to comment on uh, an article that you wrote for the uh, for the Wall Street Journal uh, on the TARP when it first came out, uh, along with uh, many of us in Congress, uh, you argued, argued that we should not uh, be investing in these uh, in a toxic asset purchase, uh, but to uh, move into an equity injection. And uh, some people, including yourself and others, have argued that uh, why are we being treated differently as taxpayers in America as opposed to uh, Great Britain? We have a 5 percent return. They have a, 5, a 12 percent. Switzerland, a 12.5 percent. Uh, Mr. Buffett got a 10 percent. Uh, would you uh, comment further on this and, and how the TARP possibly could, should be structured in a way that is more beneficial uh, to the economy and to the American taxpayer? Well, certainly. Uh, in terms and could of you speak up? Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. In terms of using uh, the TARP money for equity instead of buying assets is much more beneficial. And the benefit can be, can be uh, described very simply. Uh, if you put a dollar of equity in a bank and a bank uses 15 to 1 leverage, then that dollar would support $15 of new lending. If you merely use that dollar to buy a toxic asset from a bank for a dollar, it doesn't increase the equity and doesn't provide for any 
uh, new lending besides the dollar of equity provided. So the leverage to support the system and provide for liquidity and new lending is far more efficient by putting in equity rather than buying assets. So and, I think and, the And could you comment on the difference between the equity return to the taxpayer, 5 per percent versus uh, Great Britain, Switzerland, yes. and even Mr. Buffett? Yes, so the, so, the, so the change in TARP to, to buy equity instead of assets is very beneficial. But secondly, the terms that the Treasury has been providing equity, it seems to be very generous to the recipients, that it's way below what market terms are, what the firms would have to pay if they raise this money privately, and is also considerably below uh, the returns that other governments get when they they're forced involuntarily to support the financial institutions with equity. So Thank I think you. the the three Go ahead. the Any, three changes I would recommend is that if for future equity injections the government should get a higher dividend, perhaps around 10% and warrants that equal a greater percentage of the investment than they're currently getting. Uh, secondly, in order to restore the equity in the financial firms I think it's imperative that while that preferred stock is outstanding, that common div cash dividends on common be prohibited. And as an additional means of creating more equity that ultimately will allow the, pre the, the company to pay back the preferred, that cash compensation be capped and bonuses above that amount be paid in additional shares of common stock. That will go a long way to restoring the equity in these financial firms. My time has expired. I wish I could ask many more questions. Thank all of you for your very insightful and important testimony. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, gentleman from Connecticut. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I um, only have five minutes, so I'd love some short answers, and then I'm going to just focus on one individual just so I can pursue a little more in detail. I'd like to ask each of you, uh, and I'll just preface it, when I meet with hedge fund uh, uh, partners, uh, and they're in a room and I ask them about treating capital gains income uh, as capital gains or as regular income. When they're with their colleagues, they say we should have capital gains treated the way it is. And when they meet with me privately, they put their arm around me and say, Chris, this is crazy. Uh, they should be treated as ordinary income. Um, so, um, you know, the people that I respect look me in the eye and say it should be treated as regular income. I'd like each of you to tell me quickly, capital gains or regular income? Mr. Soros? I, th I think earned income should be taxed as earned income. If you have a partnership arrangement and, you, you, and that allows you to take capital gains and you want, uh, you want to change that, I think that that would be appropriate. It would be okay, inappropriate to... Let me just to cut you off, Mr. Soros, because you've answered the question. Do you all agree with it or do you disagree? Do you no, all no I, I, I am in agreement with, with it being taxed as earned income. But I would take exception if this was only applied to hedge funds and not other forms of partnership. I'm sorry. I thank you for f finish the answer. Do any of you disagree with that answer? Uh, I, I, I disagree to a certain extent. I think that um, hedge funds shouldn't be looked at differently, and, and it's really a function of the underlying asset. If you have an asset and you hold it for longer than 12 months, then you should be subject to a capital gains tax like a, a, the, a, any other individual or real estate partnership, or um, okay, any you've answered any the investor. question. I just have so little time. I don't okay. mean any disrespect. Mr. Griffin, I'm just going to focus in on you because I just have to isolate one, and you're the furthest away from my district, so if I offend you, I won't, <laughs> I won't bother you. Um, I'm told you can only have 99 members uh, as part of a particular hedge fund. It's 99 or less. Is that correct? The rules have changed over the years. That's not necessarily applicable anymore. But it's limited? Yes. Um, uh, what concerns me is that some funds say 20 percent uh, profit, 1 percent management fee. I'm told that you don't do 1 percent management fee, you do cost, and that could be closer to 8 percent. Is that accurate or not? We do pass through cost. Uh, cost, as we define, will include, for example, commissions paid to other firms. So does it amount to more than 1 percent? Yes, it does. Okay. Um, I'm also told that some of of your funds have done well and some haven't. Uh, and the accusation was that the funds that have done better are the ones you have your own money in, your own personal money, and the funds that haven't 
have not. And I want to know if that's accurate. That is completely inaccurate. I am the single largest investor in our largest funds by a significant margin. I'm also the largest investor, and some of our funds have been very profitable this year. So would your statement uh, for the record be, and under oath, that, that you uh, have investment in every fund that you have or just some of the funds? I have a material, several billion dollar investment in Wellington and Kensington. Right. And I have an investment in these several hundred millions of dollars in our other funds. Okay. And, and in the one that you have the most investment in, has that done the best or the worst or somewhere in between? Regretfully, it has done the worst. Let me ask all of you then, uh, do you think that you should be required to have your funds, your own personal funds in every fund that you have? The implication is that since you make 20 percent of the profit that you are, might tend to be more risky with the funds you may not have your own money in because you still make 20 percent. And if you lose, if the funds lose, you don't lose anything. So let me ask you about that, uh, Mr. Soros. Well, I, uh, uh, exactly in order to avoid this kind of conflict of interest, I only have one fund, uh, and all my assets are in that fund. I see. Has that fund done better or worse than your other funds? Th there's no, no comparison. It's the only one. Okay. I'm sorry. You just have one fund. Yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you. Oh, okay. Well, no, we, we uh, I, I have. I can't hear you. You're mumbling. Well, all right. Is that better? Yep. All right. Um, I have uh, substantial amounts of money in the three different funds that we, uh, that we manage. I think that that question is generally asked in due diligence by people considering investing in hedge funds. We always do. We, we invest in, a, in the family, invest, we invest in many, many hedge funds. And uh, that's a first due diligence question. Does the fellow have uh, skin in the game or whatever? Right. Does he have a match? So to a large extent, I think that issue is taken so care of by the, the market. Thank you. Paulson? Yes. Uh, all my uh, assets are invested in the funds that we manage. I don't have any outside investments. I think it's very important that the manager aligns themselves with the investors. And in my situation, I'm the largest investor of both of, in both of my funds. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, gentleman from Maryland. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Soros, um, Mr. Sauter had some comments about you a little bit earlier, and I just want to let you know that I thank you for what you all have done for the citizens of Baltimore and my district. Uh, it has been simply phenomenal, and I thank you and the Open Society Institute. Let me go to all of you and just to, to kind of piggyback on some of the things that Mr. Shays was just talking about. Um, each of you appearing uh, here, uh, my neighbor, uh, when I was on his way to work this morning, said uh, to me, he said, how does it feel to be going before five folks who have got more money than God. Um, and uh, I'm sure you will disagree with him. But you are private citizens and your income is not required to be publicly disclosed. So I'm, I'm going to respect your privacy and not disclose your specific compensation. But you have provided information about your income to the committee and it shows that although there are individual variations, on the average each of you made more than $1 billion in 2007. I got to tell you, that is a staggering amount of money, and I'm not knocking you for it. But even though you made enormous sums, you are not taxed like ordinary citizens, like the guy that said what I told you. Your earnings are not taxed as ordinary income. Instead, the fees you receive are called carried interest, which means that they are taxed at capital gains rates. There are two capital gains rates, a low 15 percent rate for long-term gains and a higher rate for short-term gains. What this means is that to the extent your earnings are based on long-term gains, the tax rate is just 15 percent. My question for you is whether this is fair. A school teacher or a plumber or a policeman makes on the average of $40,000 or $50,000 to $50,000 a year, yet they had to pay 25 percent tax. You make a billion dollars, yet your rate can be, can be as low as 15 percent. Is that fair, Mr. Paulson? I want to start with you because I understand that a significant part of your earnings can be short-term gain, but not all of it is. And Mr. Paulson, press accounts say that you earned over $3 billion in 2007. Uh, if just 20 percent of your income is long-term gain, 
That's over $600 million in income that is being taxed at a low rate. And so would you, I'll start with you and I'll just. Well, we, uh, we certainly appreciate. I want you to keep your voice up for my questions. Yeah, we certainly ap appreciate your concern for uh, a fairness in the tax code. But, but I will say I believe our tax, uh, our tax situation is fair. Uh, if your constituents, whether they are a plumber or a teacher, bought a stock and they own that stock for more than a year, they would pay a long-term capital gains rate. Mm -hmm. So for our investments, to the extent I own investments for more than a year, I also pay a long-term capital gains tax. Mm -hmm. If we own an investment for less than a year, we pay short-term capital gains, which is taxed as ordinary income. And any fee income we receive, such as management fees, uh, for that is strictly ordinary income. So, so but this, I, is, this is about money that you are managing for other people, not, not, it's not your money, right? In other words, you, you said if I hold certain things for so long, but you are actually getting paid for what you do, what well, you, the, the work the, that you the perform, way, is that the right? Way, the way partnership accounting works, if, if, you, if the partnership owns an asset for more than a year, that asset is taxed at long-term capital gains, and that tax is passed along to all the partners in the same way. If the, if the asset in the fund, in the partnership, is a short-term capital gain, then all the partners, including the general partner, pay short-term capital gain. Do so you have an opinion, Mr. So Falcone? Um, yes, I do. I think that um, the important thing to realize that hedge funds, quite frankly, are not and probably should not be treated any differently than, than any other investor. And as the case may be with my particular situation, last year uh, approximately 98 percent of my taxable income was taxed under ordinary income. Um, but I think it is important not to differentiate between hedge funds and uh, the rest of the investment community, whether they are private equity or real estate or even individuals or the doctor that may own uh, his hospital and decide to sell it. So would, would any of you support repealing this tax, tax loophole and taxing your income at regular income uh, rates, Soros? Uh, I do. I, I can't do. hear you. I, I, I agree to it. I have no problem with it. Mr. Simons? Yeah, I said uh, the, carried in, the carried interest portion uh, represented by other people's money, uh, if that were raised to higher levels, that would be okay with me. Mm. Mr. Falcon, you just stated your position, I think, right? Yes, I did. Mr. Paulson? Yeah, I, 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 would, uh, uh, I don't think it is a loophole. Uh, the carried interest merely passes through the, the nature of the income to the partners. If it's short-term capital gain, we're taxed at short-term capital gain. If it's long-term capital gain, it's taxed at long-term capital gain. Mr. Griffin. I think tax equity is incredibly important. And most of the income, if not all the income that I generate, is subject to either ordinary or short-term tax rates, the highest marginal rate. But if you and I were to start a restaurant together and I was to be the chef and an operator and you were to put up the capital, even though my labor goes into making that restaurant work every day, if we sell that business two or three years down the road, I will get long-term capital gains. Our society preferences long-term capital gains from a tax perspective. And I think what we should seek to have is consistency in how we treat long-term capital gains, whether it is the hedge fund manager, the private equity manager, or the entrepreneur who starts a restaurant together. I see my, my time is up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Turney? Thank you. Uh, just to follow up on that, Mr. Griffin, when you use your analogy about the restaurant, when you are the chef, the money you earn for being the chef gets taxed at a regular income rate. That's correct, sir. When you are managing other people's money, you are in effect the chef of that process. You get taxed for those earnings at the regular income tax rate. And management fees are taxed as ordinary income, sir. Well, you get, which one do you term the management fees? The 1 or 2 percent or the 20 percent? The, the management fees are generally taxed as ordinary income for most Just, firms. What are you referring to as the management fees? The 1 or 2 percent. What, one, two, three. Set that aside. You get 20 percent and the other partners get 80 percent of the earnings, correct? That is correct. You get 20 percent for the money that, for the effort you made in managing those funds and making those investments and doing that type of work. That is being the chef. 
not in terms of selling the product. I know what you want to do. You want to wash it all through and come out the other end. But the fact of the matter is that's compensation for your day-to-day -day efforts of managing those funds, is it not? Well, let's go back to the story of the chef. The chef in his salary every year is taxed as ordinary income. But if the restaurant right. has capitalizable value. Right. But you ain't, you're not selling anything when you're getting compensated for the day-to-day -day management efforts that you make. If I make an investment, that creates long-term capital gains. So I invest in a biotechnology company where the stock appreciates. A good portion of that money isn't yours, right? That's correct. So when you get 20 percent, it's for investing other people's money as well as your own. That is correct. And some of that compensation is for your efforts in managing and investing those other monies. That is correct. Right. And that, my, my friend, I should suggest to you is what we're saying ought to be taxed as regular income. You can disagree, but I just don't want you to take the chef analogy too far. But, just to be very clear, all of my income, or virtually all, is taxed at the highest marginal rates. As it should. All right. So I speak then to we this don't from, disagree from on a that, conceptual. But I'm talking, I don't want you to take your chef analogy and confuse people with that. Let me just, Mr. Paulson, except for our disagreement on that particular issue, uh, I was thinking that we probably had the wrong Paulson handing out the top monies here because uh, I agree with you, uh, in essence, about us not getting the deal as taxpayers that we ought to be getting, uh, and fairly adamant. And I can, I can dare say that you can't walk down the street at home in any of our districts that people don't make that point. Is what the heck are we doing giving money to these institutions and they're out there uh, giving bonuses, paying high salaries without being capped, uh, and then whilst around giving dividends. So I, I think that's an important point that I know you've already mentioned that twice now, but I think it probably can't be mentioned loudly enough and clearly enough while the other Mr. Paulson is busy determining what he's going to do. What I'd like to know is whether the other four panelists here agree with our Mr. Paulson here that uh, if we're going to have taxpayer money go to any of these institutions, we ought to get a better deal, uh, of, you know, better security on that, make sure the compensation isn't excessive. Uh, and make sure, in fact, that dividends aren't given out in cash during that period of time when we've got the guarantee of the investment made. Mr. Soros? Uh, I'm sorry, I, did, I didn't follow the question pro <laughs> properly. I'm sorry. The, uh, in my old business, we used to be able to have it read back. But uh, do you agree with Mr. Paulson uh, that as long as taxpayers' money is being given to these institutions uh, for the purposes of, of thawing out the so called credit freeze? that we ought to be getting a better deal for the taxpayer. We ought to be getting better security for that investment. We ought to be making sure that the banks or the people that are the entities are not giving excessive compensation with it, bonuses and things of that nature, and are not giving cash dividends while the, share, the stockholders, the taxpayers' money is there. I, I, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, sure that I, um, I would agree with Mr. Paulson on that. Why not? Um, I think that if you have a capital increase in the banks, uh, then uh, I think that uh, as long as the money is put up by the by the uh, shareholders, there should be no change in the. It's up to the shareholders how they compensate. But this is taxpayer money, not shareholders' money. No, well, when it's taxpayers' money, no, I d I dare I agree. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yes. Mr. Simons, do you also agree? Yeah, generally speaking, I do, although I will make the point that when this first round of, of money was put into these banks, uh, some of them didn't want to take it. And the uh, Paulson said, everyone has to take it. And therefore, if you're going to, because he didn't want the public to distinguish which bank is stronger, which bank is weaker, or so on, which maybe was a good idea, maybe wasn't. But the result is that uh, everyone had to take it. And if you have to take it, well, then you can mitigate that a little bit by saying, okay, I won't gouge you too much, or whatever it would be. So uh, I'm not saying that 10 percent is gouging, by the way. But some of this money was not requested by some of these banks. Uh, to the extent that, that it was, I think it was quite a sweet deal. Well, I, I'll go on. I, I'm thinking whether you request it or not, you know, you ought to have a fair deal, not a, not a lopsided deal on that. But we can discuss that later. Mr. Well, Falcon? I, I agree. I think that to the extent that the capital is infused into some of these companies, it should be more along the lines of uh, market rates. Mr. Griffin? I believe that market rates for many of these companies would be extremely high. And if one of our goals is reduce the cost of consumer credit, this is, in essence, an indirect subsidy to the banking system that I hope they will pass on in some form or another to the ultimate consumers to whom they lend to. Thank you. Thank you all for your answers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Yarmouth. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the panel. Um, the, the testimony has been, uh, I think, unusually candid and thoughtful. I appreciate that very much. I'm going to probably cross the line a little bit that uh, Chairman Waxman said down, but I'm going to try to draw the connection. We have had a number of hearings related to the immediate financial crisis, and even going back some months, we had um, a hearing on corporate compensation and its connection to the housing crisis, and we had a panel back then that included former CEO of Time Warner, uh, former CEO of Merrill Lynch, City Group, and uh, we had Mr. Mazzillo from Countrywide. And one of the questions that I asked was when the, all these cor corporate, uh, the executive compensation committee meetings met, was there ever a discussion of things like employee w welfare, um, the communities that the corporations served, so forth, general corporate policies, or was there the discussion always about stock price? And with una unanimity, they said the conversations were always about stock price. And one of the things that's become a common theme in the hearings we've had is that uh, when you tie everyone's compensation to stock performance and relatively short-term stock performance, then you get, uh, you have an incentive or pressure for maybe riskier behavior that might have contributed to a lot of the, the crisis that we have. So I ask you, as, as uh, people who own significant positions in some of these companies, whether you have a, a concern about the corporate governance structure in this country and whether uh, we should be doing things, whether it's related to corporate compensation generally or general corporate governance laws, that might um, ameliorate some of this issue if you think it's an, a problem. Mr. Soros, would you like to start? Yeah, I, I, I'm a little bit at a loss because it's not a, not a subject that I have really uh, well, given a lot of uh, thought to. Chairman Waxman excused you, so <laughs> on that. Mr. Well, Simons? I haven't thought about it a great deal, but I've, generally speaking, I'm a f more of a fan of uh, profit sharing uh, for CEOs uh, than I am of, uh, of stock options. It's, uh, the, the latter is very volatile and you never know quite what he's getting. I, in this case, I would uh, echo Mr. Uh, Simon's comments. I, I'm inclined to, to uh, agree with um, Mr. Paulson and Mr. Uh, Simons that, um, that it is um, important to to participate from a compensation perspective as it relates to profit sharing along those lines. Mm -hmm. Mr. Griffin, do you like I will it? concur with the other the, panels. In, in today's Financial Times, uh, Professor Malkiel from Princeton suggested um, that one of the things that might be considered is when you have compensation tied to stock options and so forth that, that it involve restricted stock that uh, the CEO could not sell until some time after the, uh, he or she left the company, and therefore the concern would be more in the long-term interests of the corporation rather than more short-term stock performance. Is that something that resonates with any of you that you think might be a good idea? You can, uh, you can say you didn't think about it. I think that would be a terrible idea. Terrible idea? And part of the reason is that we need executives in America to take risks whether it's to put the money down on the line for R&D and drugs mm -hmm. or willing to try to create new ways to power America, we need executives to take risk. And what we find is that as executives become more successful, they actually become more risk adverse often. And so if you have their entire net worth tied up in stock options, which are inherently risky, and then they cannot monetize any portion of that until after they retire, I would be gravely concerned about the reduction in risk taking by America's corporate leaders. It sounds good on paper. I don't think it will give us what we need as a country. We need innovation. Good. Does anybody else want to address that? I don't have any other questions, but if you don't, that's fine. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, gentlemen from Tennessee, Tennessee, I'd Mr. like Cooper. to excuse myself for a moment. I'll be right sure. back. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The headline of this hearing. I think it's definitely Paulson v. Paulson, as has been enumerated. John Paulson accuses Henry Paulson of botching the bailout because the taxpayers do want a good return for their money, and they're very worried when we're only getting 
5 percent interest on the preferred stock and not getting sufficient warrant positions. But I think the real purpose of this hearing is to understand better the role that hedge funds play. And I asked the previous panel, the professors largely, if it is possible to distinguish between hedge funds that hedge and funds that are more speculative. Because Mr. Paulson, for example, bet right on the, the down housing market, but that was not necessarily uh, a position. You know, for example, if you had taken that position three or four years ago, you wouldn't be as uh, wealthy as you are today. The only thing worse than being wrong about the market is being right too early. So is it possible to distinguish between hedge funds that hedge and those that are speculative? Well, well, let me first say I hope this is not uh, uh, Paulson versus Paulson or that I'm accusing uh, Paulson of, of boxing. Could and you pull that mic? Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't want to be. We, we have a great difficulty hearing you, so could you pull the mic closer to you or Absolutely. you can talk a little louder? I, I'd be glad to do that, Thank Mr. You very Chairman. Much. I, uh, I am I no way want to be uh, critical of uh, Mr. Paulson. He's done a tremendous amount for our country. Uh, is willing to uh, change his position when the circumstances change, and I think he has uh, reoriented the TAR program in the right direction. Uh, the the second part of your uh, question, are there? Well, I really wasn't sure what it was again. For example, Mr. Simons doesn't purchase credit default swaps. He's not leveraged much. Uh, other hedge funds have quite different strategies. We'll never know because it's a black box trade secret. But is it possible? for the pension fund and other investors to know um, in advance whether they are buying interest in a yes. hedge fund or a speculative fund. Now, I know in the private conversations you reveal a little bit more of your operations, but most people have no idea whether it is a hedge fund that hedges or is not. It is a question about truth in advertising. Yeah, Congressman Cooper, that is a very good question. Uh, investors never have to invest in a hedge fund. Oh, if, I know they don't they, get, if they don't get the proper transparency. They don't, but there is a Wisconsin school board that put money in SIVs that got traced all around the world. You know, a lot of investors don't necessarily know. So right now we have hedge fund as a category that is not defined, and some of which hedge, but many of which do not. And people have no advance notice. So there is no truth in advertising. Well, we for one give a lot of transparency to our investors. And while we don't disclose them publicly, we, we do disclose a great deal about what we are doing to our investors. So I would encourage uh, investors such as pension funds that they invest with, with managers that give disclosure so the, the pension funds know what they are investing in. Do any of the witnesses know, Mr. Soros? Uh, yeah, I, I think that um, uh, uh, hedge funds, many, uh, several hedge funds, uh, have claimed to uh, follow a market neutral strategy exactly because uh, institutional investors uh, want to see low volatility. And I think that was rather misleading. I don't think it was deliberate uh, misleading, but actually, uh, because there is this uh, false paradigm that has prevailed, has pervaded the uh, thinking on this subject, uh, uh, people thought that they were market neutral. And in actual fact, when an event occurred that was not a random uh, 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 fluctuation or deviation, then it turned out to be non-market neutral. Thank you. You mentioned that investors usually want low volatility. The markets have been unusually volatile recently, and some trading strategies uh, depend on volatility. Um, how much volatility is enough? Well, you see, 200 points a day, 500 uh, uh, points a day, 1,000 is more basic, better. Basically, what uh, what the prevailing paradigm has neglected is the uncertainty that is connected with this reflexive connection. Uh, um, we have become very adept in calculating risk. And by focusing on risk, we have left out uncertainty. And that has been our undoing in this particular case. How about the other panelists? Is a volatility only strategy appropriate? And if so, 
is more volatility always better? Well, you see, I think volatility is an indication of uncertainty. Well. And, and the fact that you've normal volatility is 30, and it shot up to 50 and 70 and 80, it just shows the increased uncertainty that is currently prevail uh, pervading uh, the markets. Does the government have a role in limiting excessive uncertainty? Uh, well, I think that regulators have to understand that there is, there is this uncertainty in markets, and that is why the risk management methods used by individual participants who are only thinking of their own risk is not appropriate in calculating systemic risk. And to, pre to, to protect against systemic risk, you have to impose restrictions on the amount of credit or leverage uh, market participants can use. That is actually the core of my argument that I am putting forward. Mm -hmm. Congressman Cooper, yes. if I may. Mm -hmm. Good regulation, good policy helps to reduce volatility in the market. And we are extremely invested in the safety and soundness of our financial system. But doesn't your firm have a conflict of interest in grouping with CME to create clearinghouses and other means that might somehow prejudice the market? In the sense of? Well, if you are partnering with the market maker or the clearinghouse, how do people know it is going to be a fair market? Well, we would clearly have a very dis sharp distinction between our role as a contributor of intellectual property and know-how to the CME to expedite the launch of this clearinghouse from the day-to-day -day management of the clearinghouse. We will have no involvement in the day-to-day -day management of the clearinghouse because the positions of other market participants should not be made available to Citadel. But that makes investors rely on a Chinese wall instead of a greater separation. Well, CME will be running the clearinghouse. So we are not running it, just to be very clear on the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I see my time has expired. Th thank you, Mr. Cooper. Mr. Van Hollen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank all of uh, you gentlemen for your testimony. Uh, we have had a lot of discussion about uh, trying to create greater transparency uh, over hedge funds. And as I understand uh, all of your testimony, it is you, you agree with the idea that, at least on a confidential basis, uh, it would be appropriate for some federal agency, the SEC or some other federal agency, uh, to uh, monitor uh, and obtain that information for the purpose of de making a determination whether there is uh, systemic risk and putting the taxpayer at risk. Am I right about that? Okay. Yes. yes. Now, the, we had just before you a panel of a number of professors, including Professor Lowe and uh, Professor Reuter, and the question I posed was, okay, let's say you are the SEC or the regulator and you are getting this information and data, and you say your alarm bells go off. You say, look, we really do think we have a problem here, whether it is to the investors or systemic uh, risk. What authorities should they have then with respect to uh, the hedge fund? Uh, and the response we got was maybe the SEC shouldn't have that authority, but they would provide the Federal Reserve with that authority, uh, which according to their testimony would require additional uh, congressional action. So my question to all of you gentlemen is, is that something you think uh, would be necessary? Because the obvious question that comes up once you say it is okay to collect the information is, okay, you got it. Now you make a determination that something is going wrong. Shouldn't we also make sure they have the authority to deal with it, especially in light of the fact that what we have learned, at least with respect to the investment banks, uh, is that the taxpayer is, of course, uh, the sort of holding the risk as a last resort and is going to be asked and has been asked in any way uh, to go in. So I would, I would pose that question to you, gentlemen, whether you think, whether it's the SEC or the Federal Reserve, they should also have additional authorities, whether it's leverage requirements or some other powers that they can intervene with respect to a particular hedge fund that they determine is causing systemic risk. Well, I would. Uh I would definitely argue that that's exactly what you need. That's what currently is missing, and it needs to be introduced. We used to have uh, that kind of authority in earlier years. In my youth, I used to be aware of them. Uh, they have fallen into disuse, and I think they have to be brought back because 
there is a distinction between money and credit, and, and markets don't tend towards equilibrium, and it's the, do, it's the job of the regulators to prevent asset bubbles from developing. Yes. I would agree with that. I would agree as well. I'm not so sure if it should be the SEC or the Federal Reserve or a new regulatory agency, but I think it's a very good idea. I think what is important in the concept is for the hedge funds that are subject to this new paradigm to understand the rules of the road. Are we heading towards a Basel II requirement for hedge funds, for example? So long as I know what the rules of the road are, I can conduct my business in a way to be well within the lines. Yeah, that's a very good point, I think. And, and then I j just I'd like to clarify one previous statement. On the issue of clearing houses for credit default swaps, there were two primary solutions proposed over the last couple of weeks. One was the dealers in a consortium called TCC. The other is a solution by Citadel and the CME. A key distinction between these two solutions just a few weeks ago was that the CME solution is open to all, all financial market participants, both the buy side and the sell side, whereas the TCC solution, the dealer solution, was to be open only to the dealer community. And I believe that all of us on the buy side, whether we're PIMCO, BlackRock, Citadel, Paulson, would want a platform that is open to all. It goes back to transparent and fair markets. And we have seen the dealer community trying to create doubts as to why the CME solution is the best one, this issue of Chinese walls. Let me just make it clear. We need a solution to meet the needs of all market participants. And I believe that our work with the CME to do so is in the best interest of our nation and the entire world's financial system. Thank you. Thank you for that. Let me also just say with respect to the, your answers to the previous question, we appreciate it. We, we may need uh, all of you gentlemen to continue to provide that input as we go forward because, as you know, just the, the notion of providing greater transparency uh, has been proposed in the past. Uh, it was proposed after the failure of long-term capital management. Uh, we took a case to the Supreme Court that you are all very familiar with. Uh, and the fact of the matter is not you as individuals, but certainly the industry uh, fought uh, efforts uh, to provide greater transparency, to provide greater oversight uh, and some of these things. So uh, as we go through this uh, effort to uh, provide reasonable regulation of the financial markets, uh, we appreciate your, your input going, going forward as well as today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Van Hall and uh, Mr. Eisen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Soros, uh, it is good to meet you at last. Uh, I am very intrigued at some of your, your comments, and one of them particularly has to do with leverage. Is it enough or would it be at least a good, quick beginning if the Congress, obviously with the President, were to create a truth in, if you will, transparency of leverage, require standards and disclosure as, as to leverage, and of course that means that derivatively, if you leverage something and then you go to resell it, there would be standards so that if you leverage a leverage a leverage, that that would have to be transparent and flow through. If that were one of the items on President Obama's short list of things to be done in that first 100 days, would it go at least a long way toward preventing the kind of overleveraging that you are speaking of, at least the lack of visibility on overleveraging? Well, certainly the introduction of uh, uh, new fangled financial instruments has made it much harder to calculate leverage because some of those instruments are leveraged instruments. So uh, given all the derivatives that have been introduced, calculating the leverage becomes a very, very complicated uh, problem. And especially if you have um, tailor-made uh, instruments, this, then it becomes even more difficult. So I think that it may, it may be necessary to actually, uh, well, it's certainly necessary for the regulators to understand mm -hmm. uh, what they are regulating. And if they don't, 
they should perhaps not allow some of those instruments uh, to be used. So I think that the instruments themselves would have to be uh, authorized, uh, approved by the SEC or whatever before they could be used. Good point. Mr. Paulson, uh, first of all, congratulations. Uh, I am not an investor with your fund, but I noticed that you managed to be still up about 1 percent at a time in which the walls are falling all around most other people. In order to have the kind of stellar gains you have had, including obviously dealing with some of what we, we, we rename, we, we, we call them you know, uh, caustic and uh, corrosive and uh, acidic products, were you able to make sound decisions as to the real leverage that you were buying into in your investments? Absolutely. Uh, what we did was primarily buy protection on debt securities. And at the time we bought this protection, it's like buying an insurance policy, the premium was very, very low, on the order of 1 percent. Uh, so if, if, if the debt security never fell, we would lose the value of that premium. Uh, but that premium in our base funds uh, was only about 1 to 2 percent, and that was the extent of loss we would realize if our uh, investments didn't pan out. So uh, to characterize what you just said, you gambled less than those who went routinely long on any investment. Uh, I believe that is the case. So the people who invested with you, including the pension funds and so on, were gambling less because of your technique, which was available to them and you have a track history since 1994. They were gambling less because you told them that, in fact, you hedged uh, outcomes in order to protect their investment. I, I, I prefer not to use the word gambling. What we but did no, was, I, and was, I, and I, I used yeah. I didn't use it for you, but I, I used the word hedge for obvious reasons. and. The term gambling, if and, and just correct me if I'm wrong, most mutual funds, whether they're in small cap, mid cap, large cap, foreign, they ha they they basically tell you they're going to be 100 percent invested or they're going to have a ratio, and no matter what happens in the market, they don't go to all cash, and they many of them refuse to go short the market as a matter of it's in the prospectus, isn't that right? That's correct. So your technique, and the technique of virtually all hedge funds is in fact to limit risk by stating how you will maneuver in a market as it becomes less than one directional up. Isn't that true? That, that's, that's true. An important goal of our funds is to limit risk and reduce volatility. Okay. Last question, if I could, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there was some talk on the earlier panel about tax treatment, and I know this isn't the Ways and Means Committee, so I want to limit it, but do any of you see a way in which we could look at the long-term gains that you, you and your investors achieve when you are long for a period of more than a year and differentiate between those and any other investor in stocks and other equity products? Do any of you see, uh, or debt products, any of you see a way in which you could effectively differentiate, because we are often talking about hedge funds and saying, well, we have got to get rid of their capital gains treatment. The only reason I ask is, can any of you, because you are very smart people, think of a way that we would separate your category from every other mutual fund, if you will, and the capital gains treatment they get? If, if, you plan, if I may, if you plan to go down that road, there, there might be one possibility where instead uh, By the way, I don't plan to go down that road. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of having a, um, the, the horizon be 12 months, maybe make it a little bit longer for hedge funds. I'd, I'd hate to see that eliminated in, in its entirety because there are truly individuals in the hedge fund market that are investors. Um, and, and if you extend that, that time frame, that could be one way of looking at it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Issa. I, I want to thank uh, the members of this panel. Uh, the members, I think, have asked very important questions and you gave very thoughtful answers, which is uh, very helpful to us. Uh, Congress usually has trade associations at hearings and they give the predictable responses which are as in what they see their self-interest. 
And that's why we wanted to have you testify here today to get an unfiltered response and your comments and recommendations were very helpful. Uh, I believe there has been a consensus or near consensus that hedge funds can pose systemic risks and there has been a similar consensus that there should be more disclosure about the activities of such uh, hedge funds. Several, uh, several of you have urged more oversight and reasonable restrictions on leverage and closing the tax loophole that benefits hedge fund uh, managers. You're, you have also provided insightful uh, criticisms of the Federal response to the uh, financial uh, crisis. We are facing a terrible economy and enormous disruption in our financial markets. And I think your testimony is very helpful to us in pointing out ways that Congress and Federal regulators could help restore our markets. So I thank you very much for what you have done today. That uh, concludes the business before the committee and we stand adjourned.